here is singer-songwriter, broadcaster, audio-video artist, entertainment agent, and your host for the Dharmic Evolution. It's the master storyteller himself, James Kevin O'Connor. And welcome back once again. Broadcasting for the second time in the new studio. We're getting there little by little. It's a big job to get this place set up properly. Um, today, I got a really, really cool guest for you. This, this guy and I go back many, many years. Um, he's a brilliant musician. He's a composer. He's an author. He's, um, he's actually a, um, I, would, I would say he's a light in the wilderness, this man, because um, he's influenced me in so many ways. He's a professional guitarist, a bassist, a transcriber. He's a BMI composer and publisher. His music has been played and is being played internationally on TV, radio, and the web. His current single, a unique arrangement of Amazing Grace, it's available on iTunes and other online retailers. And for many years, he's performed, he's done live studio work on guitar and bass, everything from avant-garde jazz to hard rock. Unfortunately, he no longer performs after becoming paralyzed in 2003 by the rare disorder transverse myelitis. However, he still teaches, composes, and records. In 2008, he moved from the New York City area to Kentucky, where he lives with his wife, Chris, and two dogs, and enjoys playing guitar and sitting on his porch watching the grass grow. You better strap up your seatbelts, because we're hanging out with Berkeley graduate George Barker. George, welcome to the show. Good to Thanks. see you, my friend. Good to be here. Thank you for having me. It took us a while to get on board, but man, so delighted to um, share with everybody today. Um, really, a big part of my past came back in the late 70s when I stumbled into the Barker Mansion the ranch, and lo and behold, there was this jazz rock fusion band just screaming out this amazing music. And um, I guess our friendship developed shortly after that, um, with you being my first real um, mentor on the guitar. So I can't thank you enough for that and all the paths that we've traveled together. So let's dig in a little bit. Let's get started with, um, first of all, you... You moved to Kentucky a few years back. How was that transition for you? It was great. I mean, I had been coming down here ever since I was a child. My grandparents had a farm, and uh, my dad was born in Soldier, Kentucky, which is nearby. Um, so it was kind of a natural step for me eventually to move to Kentucky. I'd always planned on doing that. So uh, in uh, 2008, we made the move, me and my wife and our dogs, and here we are. And Chris still loves to cut the grass, does she not? She's actually doing that as we speak. <laughs> that was so funny. I came for a visit uh, recently to see George and Chris at their home. And uh, Chris just left the room. And all of a sudden, I see her out there on the ride more, you know, just tearing it up. And she comes in after about an hour and a half and says, you know, I just love doing that. I just love it. You know, <laughs> it's yeah. so, so satisfying. A, I think she finds it therapeutic. It's something to do. It's a tangible sign that she's been working. It's kind of uh, therapeutic. Yeah. Or meditation, I guess you might say. So. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, you know, I want to just uh, not keep everybody in suspense too long. So we're going to get into all kinds of music. And this is one, I thought I knew all of your material, George. And I listened to this last night. And uh, it's called Marantha. Is that, am I pronouncing it right? I think so. I've never actually heard the word spoken, but it means Lord come, I think. It's from the Bible. Marantha, here we go.
That was absolutely awesome. So what, I mean, the solos and the tones in that were just amazing. Can we just get into a little bit of gear? Like, uh, what, were you playing your Strat during that? What were you playing and what, what was your amp set up? I love talking about gear. Yes, I was playing my Strat, modified Strat with the uh, Spurs L tuners and Dun Seymour Duncan pickups, um, playing through the Mesa Boogie. And uh, the rest of the tone I attribute to Dandy Don Sternecker, who always does wonders with my guitar tone. So this was done. Yeah, if you, for you folks, uh, we had Don Sternecker on. I'll give you his, his uh, show in a little bit. Um, so if you want to check it out, Mixolydian Recording Studios, another place where jo George and I spent many, many um, hours, both individually and collectively. And uh, so this song, there's some badass playing on this. Um, who was on this record and uh, and when? what was the time frame for this? When was this done? This was actually done in, uh, I think it was 1986. And uh, it's uh, local Jersey musicians, uh, actually Tim Solik is the drummer. He now lives in Houston. John Gaddy on keyboards, Al James on bass, and Robert or Bobby Knapp on tenor sax. The great musicians, uh, John and Tim had played with this band, Grover, Margaret, Grover and Margaret and Zaz was Zaz, big Jersey band. Um, great musicians, one and all. Yeah, they were really, uh, they were really tearing it up for a long time. You know, it was... Funny, I saw them play um, Grover, Margaret, and Zazu Zaz many, many years ago. And then a few years later, uh, Margaret was out with Pink Floyd <laughs> singing yes. on stage, which was kind of a hoot, you know, really, really great, talented people. Um, yeah. As there, there are many, many from New Jersey who uh, many have never heard about. Tell us about, let's get into the Berkeley story. Now, you are, are a Berkeley graduate. You did your, um, your time up there, and I know you... Uh, you got really deep into theory and harmony and all of the things which I know very little about. I, I, just, I know how to harmonize with, with myself. That's about as far as I go. Tell us about the experience and, and what it did for you musically. Oh, it was an incredible place to be. Um, it, I, my main thrust was on harmony uh, and guitar performance. Um, I think uh, I'd always been into harmony because my parents my dad was a guitarist he was pro for a while before world war ii my mom always sang alto so, he, so i always heard harmonizing in the home so it was kind of a natural step for me to go to uh, a music school um so i went up there and uh, actually i didn't graduate i left the school to join a band which is actually encouraged at berkeley because you can always come back and study so i left there and played locally in new jersey and up and down the east coast um at the same time, I was taking lessons from different guitar players, Harry Leahy for a while. And then probably the most influential guitar player in my life was Barry Galbraith, who I studied with in New York City, considered one of the best sight readers on any instrument in the world. He could, he could put anything in front of me, he could read. So anyway, I learned uh, harmony and specifically guitar um, approaches to harmony from him. Um, and by the way, that band we heard before is called Outlet. I don't want to miss... Uh, is naming that band because we used to play in Jersey, many bars around the state for uh, about three or four years. Outlet. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, let me back up a little bit. When you uh, were studying with uh, Barry, like how did you get connected with him? Like what, you know, was it through Berkeley or how did you find him? It was, uh, I was working with a songwriter. We were writing songs, uh, hoping to sell some stuff to the band uh, Air Supply. And that guitar player had told me about um, Barry and said he was one of the greatest unsung uh, guitar players. Turns out he was world famous, did a lot of studio work, um, played with everybody from John Lee Hooker to Coltrane. And uh, so I went and it was just a natural fit. And, and I really um, had my nose to the grindstone with Barry. And I actually was able to join his Monday night guitar quartet, uh, which was an incredible experience. So it uh, changed my life as far as guitar playing. You know, it's funny because uh, I sat with your dad and uh, and uh, we we jammed for like it was like it wasn't it wasn't a long time because I, I had nothing to bring. I was just such a neophyte at like trying to find my way. And I'd been writing songs and, and you know, he started like me thinking about like what genre are you connected to? And he, and he listened to some of my things and he said, you know, I hear a lot of folk uh, going on, which which at the time, of course, I was immersed in Dylan and. 
And I, I think I, I hadn't even started out playing solo again, but it was such a, um, uh, a musical household because yeah. your parents were just so awesome. They invited everybody in and it was like, you know, music was allowed, you know, in my house, it was the exact opposite. I'm mean, like, you were, you were crucified if you even <laughs> thought about picking up a guitar. <laughs> so to come over to the Barker house, that's why you guys couldn't get rid of me. I'd always be hanging on the staircase. Like when, when the, the band Tangent, which you had were, was jamming and right. uh, it was such a cool experience. So your dad and mom were both musical, and I guess that's where the encouragement and the blessing came for you and your brother, Welton. Absolutely. It was a fantastic place to be brought up, and my parents were, were great. They always encouraged us to play any and all instruments. My sister's a great singer. My brother's a pianist. My Both my grandfathers played instruments and grandmothers. Um, so if music was in the family... Um, so you're right. It was, it was definitely encouraged. My dad used to come and watch me play and I could tell from his looks that he was just so happy that I was, uh, pursuing the instrument that he had played. So. I don't think I ever told you, but he was bragging about you when we had our jam session. He said, <laughs> he goes, I came home from work one day and he'd been only playing for three weeks and I couldn't believe what he was playing. <laughs> um, and you know, I gotta say the, for those of you out there, you don't know this, but George is also a, uh, instructor. If you want to get lessons on guitar, which George and I are now playing again together or, or where he's instructing me again, and it's been years and years and years. So, um, I'm going back to my electric guitar days and, uh, what a, what a great place to revisit. But, um, um, the, the thing is, when you started playing, you were like, what connected you to jazz fusion? Because when I came to start studying with you many, many years ago, the cool thing about what I learned from you was you did not like bore me with, because uh, I didn't have the head or the capacity to say, all right, learn the staff and learn the notes. And I, I just would have fallen asleep and died, quite frankly. <laughs> but I bring you like, whatever was happening at the time. Maybe it was the, the guitar solo from Hotel California, or whatever it was, or Fast Lane or something. And you would break it down and, and show me how to put the pieces together. You, you kind of were so eclectic, yet you went to Jazz Fusion and came up with this. What was the genesis for the, the uh, band Tangent? How did that all come together? Like, how did you guys put all the pieces together and suddenly decide, well, this is the kind of sound we... You know, it, because yeah. it was definitely not, you know, it was it's not exactly, uh, you know, off the shelf at Walmart. It was like something so different that, that I had yeah. never heard before. Yeah, I was, uh, once again, it was just kind of all came together. Um, I had started out being a blues player. That's all I really loved was blues. And um, a friend of mine, um, I used to go to his, ba his house and jam in the basement. They're all a bunch of seniors in high school. And I was the one guy there who was a freshman. Anyway, before he went to college, he came by my house one day and laid 12 albums on me. Um, and one of them was this album called Swiss Movement, which is a blues jazz. So it was my first in, uh, you know, introduction to jazz by way of the blues. And I heard a complexity and sophistication that was new to me, but fascinating. Um, and then from there, um, I was a senior in high school and we had a college nearby Drew University. And there was a concert of this band, the Mahavishnu Orchestra of John McLaughlin. And uh, I had heard about John McLaughlin from a friend. And uh, when I heard them, it truly really changed my life. It was just, it was incredible. Here is this guy playing with the tone of Hendrix, but with the sophistication of a Coltrane or, you know, Miles Davis. And, and it was guitar. So it was kind of a perfect introduction. So, I mean, to be a great jazz player, you're told you have to be great at blues. And it, that's what kind of led me into jazz. And then from there, it was uh, by way of Berkeley that... Um, I was able to give them the, I was given the tools to write that kind of music. And it was, uh, and my friend Jeff Chapman also went to Berkeley and we started this band Tangent together. Um, so it was uh, very organic, just kind of a, you know, influence from here and there. And I didn't know that Jeff had gone to Berkeley and that he was the first uh, capture, <laughs> the, the first, <laughs> the, or the second band member, I, I guess. But uh, what a great name. And what an awesome band. We're going to get into that in a couple of minutes. But right now, we're going to play this song. You may have heard this before, but listen to this rendition. This is Amazing Grace. Thank you. 
Amazing grace it is, George. How did you uh, get into this headspace to say, of all the things you could have covered, and by the way, what a, what a great rendition. You know, what possessed you to do this one? Was there anything special going on with you at the time that, that said, hey, I, I got I to gotta cut this? Yeah, um, I had been through some personal challenges. Um, we can talk about that, I guess. But um, my faith has always been there. I've always been a, a you know a Christian person, um, not overtly, but it's always there. My faith is very important to me. And I wanted to do something that would honor or um, either honor God or also show that, uh, you know, I was um, saved by this grace. And it was just to me that I'd always loved the song and the melody. And I thought it might be a good vehicle for reharmonization and also like a dedication. So before we get into the nuts and bolts of the arrangement and the, and the, the, um, the particular instruments chosen, um, tell us about what happened to you that changed your life in such a profound way, um, physically and like, you know, what, what led up to this? I remember it, but, but I'd like you to share with us how you ended up, where you ended up. Sure. Um, in uh, 2003, my wife and I had gone on vacation down here in Kentucky, as a matter of fact. We, I was in New Jersey at the time uh, doing music full time. I just left the corporate job, which I'd been on for a few years, and uh, was going to rededicate myself to music. And um, when we got to, down here on vacation, I felt this um, kind of a burn around my midsection. I thought maybe it was a pinched nerve. And so I didn't really think anything of it. I tried some things to try to get rid of it, and it kind of got worse. And uh, when I got back to New Jersey, I went to a doctor, went through PT, and he thought it was a pinched nerve as well. But all of a sudden, I started to feel a numbness in my legs, and it was hard for me to really walk um, for any distance. And long story short, on uh, December, um, I'm sorry, September 29th of 2003, I had to go to the hospital because I could only walk using crutches. And um, they did uh, uh, MRI and, and stuff, and later that night, uh, about 10 o'clock, the doctor came in and said, looks like you're probably never going to walk again. Uh, there's this big swelling in my spinal cord. They didn't know what it was. It just sw swelled up. They took uh, um, a sample uh, in my spinal cord and um, did a biopsy. It wasn't cancer, thank God. But it was swollen, and they, you know, they didn't know what it was. They gave me steroids, and it didn't help. And um, then I went to rehab and had to learn how to live without uh, being able to use my legs. Um, and, uh, you know, that's how it all started. But, and uh, and the, the name of, of the disease you have is, is, is it Milo? I, I'm sorry. I don't know how to pronounce yeah, it. Yeah. Th that's the interesting part. It was, um, that was in 2003, but my brother was on the internet and he was trying to figure out what might be wrong with me. He said, maybe it's this thing called transverse myelitis. Yes. Myelitis. Yeah. And, uh, uh, when I went to, finally, I went to Johns Hopkins in 2006 and sure enough, my brother, uh, was right. It was something called transverse myelitis, which they don't know what causes it. It just is your, your immune system attacking your spinal cord. And the transverse means that it's occurring across certain vertebrae, which was for me, the T6, T7 vertebrae, uh, which is around the chest, your breastbone. So I couldn't really feel anything from there all the way down. And uh, so there you go. It's transverse myelitis. A rare disorder occurs between one and four in a million. So I really hit the jackpot there. Wow. So yeah. so how is it that you are able to maintain um, such a positive attitude uh, in, in, in light of what you've been through? And you just seem to have this, um, you know, this veneer. And, and I'm not saying you don't have your bad days. I'm, I, know, I know you have, you know, you've been through so much. But the thing is, you're able to, to somehow deal with this in a way that gives a lot of people, especially me, a lot of inspiration. How do you, how do you do this? Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, my faith certainly was uh, one thing. And my wife, who's been a tremendous support this entire time, my family, brother and sister. Um, you know, I think all of them contribute something to give me the strength to go on. Um, and I think when it first happened to me, um, I kept on telling myself, oh, human beings can adapt to anything. I mean, you know, we had these people like Helen Keller and certainly even Franklin Roosevelt. He, he couldn't walk through his entire presidency. And they, if they're able to adapt, I didn't see any reason why with the help from my family and with God, I could, I could do it. 
And uh, I was just thankful, believe it or not, at the time. I was so grateful that at least I had my hands. Yeah. You know, the most to me, the most important thing. And uh, so I figured, hey, you know, I can't walk, but I can still do what I love to do, which is play guitar and, and help people. So, well, you're teaching and you're creating. Still, are you still writing? Yes, absolutely. Um, it comes in 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 starts. Um, I'll go through a dry spell. And I accept that, you know, I, I'm able to work on other things and then I'll just get a journal of an idea, a German, a germ of an idea. And, um, you know, I might start a period where I'm writing five or six songs and then, you know, I, I play those out. So, yeah, I definitely still like to create songs and I still practice every day and I'm actually taking lessons on the, on the web too. So amazing. You know, it is amazing, Grace, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, um, you know, the, the other thing about uh, which I really admire about you is here you are, you're taking lessons. You're such an, I remember you, uh, you introduced me to a guy named John Macy and uh, I went to see John play and he was just one of these blistering, you know, he was like ripping it up, a very, very accomplished player. And he was doing something similar. He was doing sort of jazz fusion type things. And, um, you know, he asked me to, to sit in with him. I was so shy. Like, I, I just said, I said, no, nah, man, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just such a neophyte. But I remember you guys got together because you were going to take lessons from him. And he just looked at you and said, there's nothing I can teach you. <laughs> and you just parted ways but became friends, you know? Yes. Yeah. Is, John was a great friend. Yeah. Great, Is he still player, around? Do you know? I haven't heard from him in years. Well, unfortunately, he's passed away. Oh, was, wow. Uh, yeah, it wow. Was, uh, he got uh, hit by a car down in Florida where he was playing. Oh, so, my God. Didn't hear yeah, that. Wow. Um, okay, I want to play another one, and this one is called What Might Have Been. Okay, what might have been, George? What is um, what might have been? What, what is what is the title? I love your titles because I know there's always some kind of message lurking behind the title, even though it's instrumental. So, so what's that one about? Um, I was thinking one day about all the things that might have happened. I think everybody does that in their life. As you get older, you think about certain periods of your life, certain maybe um, decision points where if I'd taken this road versus that road. And it wasn't looking back and regret. It was just looking back kind of um, whimsically, kind of a bittersweet thing about things that might have happened, both good and bad. Um, and I just thought that was an appropriate title. It just kind of came to me. And you're playing, uh, is that a nylon string acoustic? Yes, 
Nylon, <laughs> nylon string, but with a pick at times, which is definitely not allowed. But I figured it, it had a certain sound that I liked. I thought so because I said it's it, it sounds to me like a almost like a classical type of guitar, but it's it's bright. So how's yep. it getting that tone? You know, yeah. Now, now good ears. Did you do the same? Well, I had a good teacher. So did you do the same method on Amazing Grace? Well, that one I started out on acoustic. I thought that might be a nice intro because I'd always played it on acoustic, and then I did the transition to electric. And then I laid down bass tracks and I did it just a drum um, program and uh, I might have added some keyboard too. So Right. You know, the two of us have such a um, interesting and eclectic past of, of musical um, influences and experiences and projects. Um, when you look out at what's going on musically today, is there any, is there any kind of, uh, without being, you know, too judgmental about anything, but just uh, your take on what's going on musically. We've seen so many changes, and I'm not talking about just the business, but artistically. Um, what do you What do you think about the whole music experience? Like now that we have like literally like nine decades of of history to pull from, um, <laughs> is it is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Is it getting like, you know, any kind of opinion that you have that you'd like to share? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. I, well, I see a lot of everything. Um, I'm sometimes discouraged about popular music. Sometimes I think it, uh, it could be better. Um, sometimes I think it's a little raw as far as the language. I know if I'd heard that kind of music when I was younger, my parents wouldn't have allowed a lot of this stuff I hear. But at the same time, I also hear some great stuff, some great new artists. Um, and certainly for musicians, it's a great time to be alive with, with the, uh, resources like YouTube and the ability to send files back and forth over the internet and be able to collaborate with people around the world. So as a creative musician, it's a fantastic time to be alive, all the digital developments. Um, so it's, 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 it's good and bad. Um, some great jazz going on. I'd like to see maybe music a little more sophisticated, popular music, but yeah, hey, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I have, um, you know, I listen to a lot of the, I spin through the dials because I'm always trying to, especially, you know, trying to be somewhat of an author on a, on a music show. I, I have to stay in touch with like, who's doing what and, and what's appealing and what's not. And I think some of the songwriting has gotten a lot of, um, especially on the pop stations. Um, if it's not including drinking and fighting and cussing and, and well, you know, it's like, wait a minute, aren't they all writing the same song over and over? You know, it's just, um, I, I feel like there's uh, there's more of a need for poetry if it's in p contemporary pop music, whether that's Christian, you know, gospel, rock, soul, whatever it is. Um, you know, it's like the Jim Croce's and the Paul Simons and the people that we grew up that really had a flair for that. They're, they're not, their presence is not being made uh, known. I'm talking about the new artists that are coming up. Or, or, they're, or they're few and far between, you know? It seems yeah. like it's turned into kind of a machine-like uh, uh, business. But, um, but, but I'm hopeful for um, every once in a while you see somebody who comes along who's just like really crushing it and really doing something amazing. And um, the thing I'm hopeful for is there are more younger kids starting to... Uh, seem to be working on the craft of music and and their chops whereas you know for about 10 years ago everybody was well i got a computer i don't need to learn anything the computer makes all my sounds you know right. but uh there's nothing like good old playing you know whether it's a piano or a guitar or whatever uh to sit down and really learn learn your musical craft you know absolutely. your songwriting yep. so absolutely yeah yeah hey um how is the weather in general in Kentucky? Uh, now that we're neighbors, uh, you got to prepare me because I'm, I'm really close to you now, now that I moved to Nashville. So what should I prepare myself for? It's been hot down lately down here. Well, that's the nice thing about living down There's so many great things about living in Kentucky and the South in general, but certainly one of them is that you don't have to wear those heavy winter coats anymore. Yeah. Uh, temperature is a little bit more moderate down here. The winters aren't nearly as uh, severe. Um, you get maybe an inch of snow down here and that's considered a substantial snowfall, which is kind of nice after living in New Jersey where you had three or four feet at a time. Yeah. Um, so it is generally warmer down here. 
that's what I was warned about. My the the, the realtor who uh, got me into this house, he says, uh, "Well, you know, he goes, you got to be prepared, or it's gonna you're gonna get like an inch every year." <laughs> like I said, "What <laughs> an inch every year?" Yeah. So I was delighted to hear that. Um, and now you know what I think it's time, George. We got to get into tangent and then talk a little bit more about about the band. And this is called at the wire. <laughs> Screaming at the Wire. Love that song. Um, that one I remember vividly. You guys playing in clubs. You guys rehearsing that song. And uh, you and Jordy trading off on, on the solos on that. And the really interesting part 
is the fact that you're you're switching tones and it's like you guys are like you know you're shape shifting <laughs> like who's playing wait a minute and then no wait no i know george's style so i you know i know that's that's him over there so uh tell us about the experience of playing with you know another you know very accomplished uh guitarist and and how that went back and forth with you guys and and the experience just how it felt like in the band oh it was it was fantastic playing with such a great guitar player like jordy uh, jordy numata um yeah, and what was nice about it is he was very um he didn't have a big ego so we we just enjoyed playing with each other and it was give and take and he supported me and made me sound better and i like to think that i was able to make him sound better as well so it was just a joy to play with a guitar player like that he just had a great ear he could pick up harmonies and develop parts based on what we had written he wrote some great stuff as well we both wrote quite a bit of stuff so it was just a joy to play with him yeah, bring the kids. I remember that was yes. one of his really, really catchy pop song. That was a, a, I don't say a pop song, but it just it just jumped out at you. So right. when the when the band all, all of a sudden formed, like how did it? Like it was you and Jeff, and then of course Terry Hammer, and right. um, did it just all come together like like really fast, or was it something that took quite a while for you guys all to get together? It was it was really fast. Um, I had known Terry since high school. I remember I met him in. I think it was my junior year. And he said, I heard you play guitar. So we got together and shanwaited at ball. So I'd known him before. And certainly Jeff I'd known. Um, and this uh, drummer, Tom Betcher, great percussionist, great drummer. He'd been a friend of both of ours. And we all, Jeff and I um, and Tom all went to Berkeley. Actually, Terry moved up there while we were there as well. So we all kind of had uh, been playing together over the years. So that was a great kind of cohesive unit. And then when we got back to New Jersey, Jordy had moved out from Arizona he joined us, and uh, my brother was playing piano with the band as well. So it was, uh, it just happened all naturally over a period of a couple of years. The Berkeley boys. Yes. Pretty much, because Welton went, right? Uh, well, he went to BU, yes, but he did go to Berkeley later on, got his degree in, re in uh, engineering. Wow, yes. wow. What what a team. That was, that was, uh, that was one for the ages. Um, I remember seeing you guys. I went to Manhattan one night to see you guys play. And you didn't go on to like, it was like four in the morning. It was <laughs> like, what that, the yeah. hell is happening here? I think it was Copperfields, a club in New York City on uh, West 8th Street or some, somewhere around uh, CBGB's. Yeah. 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 And Jeff had parked his car in a, in a garage. We got back after the gig when the garage wasn't going to open until 9 a.m. So we just kind of hung out in the city until Jeff's car was ready. <laughs> Real adventure. <laughs> Did they return it to him like Simon eyes and cleaned and everything? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a good old uh, four or was it Plymouth Valiant? Yeah. <laughs> so, so the tangent thing was, was a really uh, amazing milestone in, in your past. And you've done so many other things since then. Tell us a little bit about teaching and, and where you are in, and teaching and are you and and also i would like you to talk about your transcription service as well for people out there who may need these kind of services um can you just give us a little bit of what goes on with that sure um well i, I teach people here local in kentucky and i also have a couple students um around the country i do skype where we just do it by by uh, email um and transcription i've done i've transcribed I figured it out as over a thousand, maybe 1,200, 1,300 different songs for different clients. They send me um, an MP3 of a song and I write out the different parts. Um, I still do that. And, uh, you know, along with that, I, like I said, I still practice. But the transcribing is always I've something I've always done, whether it's for students or for individual clients. I love figuring out stuff. And you learn, I learn something from it. I see how some great songs have been put together and you know, how they're written. Tell me about um, uh, when you are in a, your writing mode, do you have a favorite time of day, a time that you feel that you're more productive and more energetic um, for, for giving yourself over to the writing process? That's a good question. Um, I had written a song back in 19, it was eight, I think 1980, that actually made it onto an album. And uh, I remember writing that song. It was uh, two o'clock in the morning, and uh, I was—I had been listening to Beethoven of all things, and it just something came to me, and I wrote that song in just one sitting. Um, 
now as I've gotten older, I'm not so much of a night out, but I find the morning is a good time. You kind of, you know, once you had the first cup of coffee, I feel like I, you know, want to write. So that seems to be the, my creative time now. Something about the morning. I, I'm with you on that. Like, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm not I'm an, old now, so I can't stay up too late. So yeah. <laughs> no, no, you're not old. You're just getting rolling, man. Um, it, there, there, there is something to be said about embracing your best time. And I'm, I'm a morning guy. I'm so fresh in the morning and I just feel so good that, uh, and I, I try not to, you know, I'm the type, I don't like to leave anything on the table. I try to give every day my absolute all. And so, you know, by the time it's bedtime, man, I'm just ready. And I wake up really early and that's when I feel most energized to write. Yeah. Hey, absolutely. so, so as you look out for the rest of this year, any, um, any big goals, any big things, any big plans with the website and with what you're doing for others, as far as, uh, training, teaching, anything we should know about that's special, um, or that you're just looking forward to in general. I'm just looking forward to, to teaching. Um, I always like interacting with people who are excited about playing guitar or music theory or harmony. So that's certainly something that's just an ongoing joy. Um, I'm, I found a great church, so I want to get more involved in that. I really enjoy my, my, uh, my belief. Um, and I just enjoy trying to get better. Um, you know, I just want to keep on learning. Awesome. George Barker, always a pleasure, my friend. Um, thank you so much for being a part of the Dharmic Evolution. On behalf of all those everywhere who are uh, maybe in a situation like you, I know you're going to bring a lot of uh, joy, hope uh, into their hearts who need to hear this, who need to hear your story. And, uh, you know, just just moving on, just try to stay patient with me because, <laughs> because you know I'm a test case student, but... Uh, I look forward to uh, more guitar uh, work with you. And uh, I also just put this in your notes that uh, I see us getting back in the studio to do something creative uh, in the near future as well. And I look forward Ready. to that. So yeah, George, God bless you. May, uh, may all of your dreams come true. And thank you so much again for being a part of this show. It's always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you. Pleasure being here. Maranatha. Amazing grace, what might have been, and at the wire. These are the songs of George Barker. We covered a lot of really cool things today. Soldier Kentucky, John Lee Hooker, Swiss Movements, Johns Hopkins, Transverse Myelitis. Look it up and see what George goes through every day. Let's not forget Jeff's Plymouth Valiant stuck in New York City in the lockup, but we got him out. Jordi Numata, Terry Hemmer, Tom Betcher, Weldon Barker, and Jeff Chapman, members of Tangent. Hope you guys enjoyed this show today with George Barker. I sure did. What a trip down memory lane and what killer music. Hey, if you need some uh, assistance in your guitar playing, go to georgebarker.com and see what he has to offer to help you. And you can check out George on all the socials that are included in the show notes right here on the Dharmic Evolution. And also, if you have not yet participated yet, go to the Dharmic Evolution Facebook community page. Post your content, your songs, your videos, your um, blogs, anything you have going on. Do you have a new book? Are you doing a presentation somewhere or a speech? Put it up there so the world can support you. Also, on the Dharmic Evolution website, everything is there for you to participate and enjoy all of the content we put up there. And if you know somebody who's a slamming singer-songwriter, Musical guests are welcome, so just go to the guest tab and hit it up. Let us know who it is, and we'll get them a booking on this show. If you like what you're hearing on the Dharmic Evolution, please subscribe to the show and share it with somebody. Share it with a neighbor, a friend. If you don't have any friends, call me up. I'll be your friend. That's it for me today. I'm your host for the Dharmic Evolution, James Kevin O'Connor, singer, songwriter, audio, video, artist, master storyteller, and international talent agent. So until the next time when we meet again, I'll either see you on the socials or I'll see you from the stage. <laughs>